I am the CEO and founder of Los Amigos. We supply specialty coffee from Latin America, especially from Guatemala, um, to Europe. And we are very happy to present this year our producer and friend Francisco Castilla, Castillo from Finca La Crucita. Finca La Crucita is located in Santa Rosa in Guatemala. It's about 15 hectare and 1,600 meter high. And Francisco is talking today about the Im uh, impact of climate change in his crop and in his whole production. So it's a really, I think, modern topic and it, he has a really scientific approach, not only to this presentation, but also to the way he's producing the coffee. So we were so astonished by it that we thought, okay, we have to bring him to Europe and we are very thankful that he did all the travel from Guatemala here with us to present it to you today. Enjoy the talk. If you have questions, please feel free to ask them after the lecture. And we will also have a small cupping of Francisco's coffee. Um, we will talk about this later, what it is. So it would be around 1.15 when we are ready. Thank you for your attention. No, I'll start with how I, why I approach coffee in the scientific way that I do. And this is because when I graduated from school, I wanted to uh, study chemistry and genetics in tropical plants. And the only place who offered such a, a career in university was in the island of Hawaii. So, well, of course, I, at that age, you misbehave a little bit. You go out partying. And I brought the idea to my father about me wanting to go to Hawaii to study this career. And he says, like, this is not happening to you, fellow. You're I'll give you three options of study. You can do agriculture, agriculture, or agriculture. And I'm like, well, with that broad range, I'll choose agriculture. So, but when I got to the farm, I realized that everything in the farm has to deal with chemistry. And this is the reason why we took the approach that you're going to see, where we have our own research department inside the farm. There's three people working there constantly researching and doing experiment with the coffee plantation and giving results every year. We have studies that have gone on for more than 14 years already. Uh, we're in partnership with companies like Bio, for example, developing some uh, herbicides that are uh, better suited for what's going on with the climate change. You will see them uh, come after in slides. So what do we know about climate change? The only thing we are for certain time is that it is happening. We already know it's there. Uh, carbon dioxide levels have rised in the past 15 years. They went from being 300 parts per million to 400 parts per million, which is historically we've never been at these levels. So this means that sunlight coming through the atmosphere will enter our uh, global, global, our Earth and it'll start bouncing inside and it'll take longer for those solar rays to come out of the earth and this is called the greenhouse effect so they stay for long they stay for longer periods of time inside the atmosphere and this creates what everybody knows as global warming so temperatures are rising and we see the effects of global warming well ice is melting this we already know from uh, pictures in history. Uh, species that depend on this cold climate to reproduce have fallen, in, I mean, two thirds in numbers, like penguins, for example. They cannot reproduce the way they were reproducing. Sea levels, which is very dangerous for humans, are raising really fast, faster than what they did. And species that like, do not depend, but like cold weather are moving higher in the mountains, thus affecting the entire chain food in the lower areas of the glaciers. Floods and droughts, you've seen hurricanes hitting the United States harder and more often. We've had it in Guatemala. We used to have one hurricane every 10 years. Now we've had one per year. They don't come up to be pretty strong because we're way down uh, in the system, but they're like a uh, number one category or a tropical storm, and this will 
bring too much rain into the country so floods, mudslides and things like this are happening now instead of once every 10 12 years they're happening now almost every year we get one tropical storm um, in the country and extreme weathers we've seen Texas being hit by eight tornadoes at the same time this wouldn't happen uh, before so this uh, winds in Guatemala we used to have winds that were 60 kilometers an hour now every eight or ten years we're having winds that are almost 150 kilometers an hour and they're wrecking the entire forestry system and they hit the farms pretty hard so that's what happening with the world what's happening with the plants what's going on with our coffee plantations well precipitation is going to increase it has been increasing lately so this means we'll see it in a slower uh, area um, the patterns have been changing meaning rain will not be the same we used to have a pattern of, pattern of rain we'll see it uh, in a further slide but uh, the M creates in our area it would create a sort of an M having two high peaks of precipitation then one drier now that's not happening anymore this make insects become out of sync with their pollinating partners and coffee depends a lot on insects uh, weeds are more aggressive nowadays because there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere so they grow more they compete more with coffee for the spacing um, the water availability change and although there are some scientists who say there's more carbon dioxide and 50% of the plants are carbon dioxide, 45% is water, and only the rest 5% is the fertilizer we put in. Uh, you would need to have that 5% of fertilizer differently distributed in able to take advantage of those higher carbon dioxide levels. What have we felt in our country? Well, temperature, Central America is one of the areas that is going to get hit the hardest with the climate change. Europe, United States, South America are higher by one Fahrenheit degrees in temperature. We are up 1.5 Celsius already in temperature. So we're getting hit hardest in, the, in this area. We've gone from 179 days of rain to 145 days of rain, but we're getting the same amount of rain. That means it's raining more in less time. So we'll see what that does to the plant. Climate has higher temperatures during the day and lower temperatures during the night. So this separation between high and low temperature have gotten wider in the scale. So this means that flowers, for example, will bloom faster because they reach that cold level that they need faster. And you'll see this, you'll see me talking a lot about a molecule called abscisic acid. This abscisic acid, we'll talk about it slower, but it's a hormone that coffee produces to regulate stress. Who are we? Well, we're Finca La Cosita. We're located inside the crater of a volcano. It's called Volcán El Tecuamburro. And uh, the reason why we have this unique uh, production of coffee is because from the crater, there are still a lot of gases emanating and these gases are very rich in sulfur and some other elements so when it rains all of this sulfur that has been accumulated in the microclimate will pour down with the water so we have acid rains more often than the rest of the countries around us we might have uh, out of those 149 days at least 100 will be acid in other places you'll get 30 days of acid rain Hours, well, they're not extreme, but they're always acid. So, um, you know how amino acids in plants are created by sulfur, nitrogen, carbon. So, we get to have more sulfur in our plants. And if you've followed, uh, there's a World Organization of Fertilization, they say that one of the elements that is going to become scarce for food for people is sulfur. 
because of the loss of less uh, uh, gas emission with sulfur. There's four times less sulfur in the atmosphere than what they used to be. So sulfur is becoming an issue in plantations like rice, tobacco, and other places. All of the process of the coffee is done in our own mill. We, are, we own a farm which is next to La Cosita, and there we have the mill. Uh, we mill the coffee, all of the coffee is sun dried. We don't use any other process, we don't use African beds, we don't use, we use regular patio sun drying. It takes us 30 days to dry uh, coffee because we get, since we're inside a volcano, the sunlight will start heating the patios around 10 o'clock at uh, morning, and but it will be completely out by three. Mm -hmm. So we only get very little uh, direct sunlight to the coffee. And harvest is from December to April. And we cup every day of harvest. We separate every day of the harvest, we number it, and then at the end we'll do groups uh, of coffee that have cup similar. So you'll say, so what's the relation between La Cusita, Francisco, and climate change? Well, we decided to investigate, see? There was the door of opportunity for the university. So we started by measuring the rain patterns in the farm. And we discovered what I was telling you about, that we used to have an M-like rain pattern. We used to have a peak in June, July, one in October. August used to be pretty drier than the other months. And this happened 2005, 6, 7, 2008. We got the same M, but we had the first tropical uh, wave through the country. So this was a higher M. It rained more, but it still continued with the M pattern. Then 2010, 2011, up to today, these patterns have completely changed. There's no M pattern. This meaning we have, we might get a dry season in the middle of the rainy season. We might not have the dry. So this really changed what we call the matrix or gravitational potential. See. Coffee will absorb its nutrients through the water that comes to the ground, dissolves the nutrients in the ground, then by the heat it will start evaporating through the leaves and this is the way coffee pulls nutrients towards its leaves. Now, when the rain pattern is altered, that means the food availability for the plant will be altered as well. When you get more rain in less time, you have more of a gravitational potential. This means that it starts raining and when it's matrix, it rains a little bit and water will move towards the side. But when it starts raining too fast and too much, the water will start pushing down and gravity will start pulling. Now, coffee absorbs 90% of the elements from the ground in the first 15 centimeters. If it's past 15 centimeters, the coffee will not be able to absorb it. So, when you're getting rains of two inches per day, which is five centimeters, pretty much three days of rain, and your nutrients will be out of reach for your plant. This creating something that is called, in agriculture, leaching of the fertilization. You've heard it, I'm sure. Then another thing that happens is that plants need at least 25% of oil inside that soil, to be able to have water and absorb nutrients, but they also need to breathe. They need the oxygen to live. So what happens when it rains two inches in 30 minutes is that the entire uh, first five centimeters of the, of the soil will be completely filled with water. They'll be saturated. There'll be 100% saturation of water in that area, so the plant will start presenting stress. And what does it do when it has stress? It'll create abscisic acid. So this will start to change the behavior of the plant. Once the plant is producing the abscisic acid, even though later on the, the soil will start to dry, she will not be absorbing elements because one of the characteristics of abscisic acid in a plant is to close the stomach. So there will be no evaporation to the atmosphere. So how do we measure this? Well, we got this equipment in which we create vacuum from the soil at the same force as the plant roots create vacuum with this evaporation system. It is almost one atmosphere of force, 
and we're constantly measuring what is available to the plant at 20, 40, or 60 centimeters in the soil. So we're measuring the leaching of the fertilizer through the soil. We then create a curve of this vulnerability of elements through the years, knowing when is what available for the plant. We started doing it without any fertilizer, fertilizer and then we started adding the fertilizer to be able to create more of a flat line on these peaks that you're looking at this here. Then, of course, there's a relationship between one element and the other one. Why? What would happen if I were um, to give you, let's say, for breakfast, uh, 10 pieces of bread and no water? You won't be able to have the 10 pieces of bread. What if I were to give you three pieces of bread and three glasses of water, or three cups of coffee and two muffins? Then you'll have your two muffins, but if I gave you 20 muffins and one cup of coffee, you'll have one muffin. The same is with the plants. If you give them 400 pounds of nitrogen, which is supposedly to be uptaken by a plant which produces 100 bags per 7,000 square meters, she'll intake 400 pounds of nitrogen, but she won't intake them unless it, she's got the right amount of sulfur, the right amount of calcium, the right amount of magnesium. So we knew this by books. We knew it was there, existed for other crops like rice, like wheat in the United States. We weren't finding it for coffee, so we created our own. We started doing applications of nitrogen, seeing the other elements, which one was gaining higher, which was not getting there. And we developed this relationship. Nitrogen has to do with phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur. Potassium has to do with magnesium. Nitrogen has to do with copper and bottom. Phosphorus and magnesium go together. And then, see, we knew what was going on in the soil solution. We knew the relation they needed to be in, but were they getting absorbed by the plant? So we started taking samples from the leaves. And we created this curve of absorption in the leaves. So we find out very interesting things. For example, this is only one quick example. Nitrogen, which is very important to form pollinating tubes in coffee flowers, were being under the levels we wanted at the time of coffee flowering. Phosphorus, for example, which is really needed to ripen coffee, were at lower levels at the type of ripening. So we started correcting all of this through this information that we got, and we started having much better levels of nitrogen and other elements in the plant. So you're going to say, okay, so Francisco has measured the roots, has measured the cell solution, the leaves. What about the coffee grain, which is what has us everybody here? Hmm. Well, we started measuring coffee grain elements as well. And we started to discover what was the coffee grain element relation to quality when you cup your coffee. And we started to discover that there was, for example, quick example when <coughs> nitrogen, 95% of what this coffee grain will have when it gets to you here will get absorbed in the first 60 days after the flower is pollinated. If it's not there for those 60 days, then the coffee grain will not get it, and you'll have a smaller coffee grain at the end of the year. Potassium, on the other hand, absorbs most of its potassium at the end of the, of the year when it's moving the sugars into the coffee to ripen. We also discovered, and this was something very important for us, that something called a base relation, which is how much calcium, potassium, and magnesium going to the coffee grain have to do directly with what good of a cup you're getting when you're tasting the coffee. So we discovered that anywhere from 2 to 225% of the body mass of a coffee grain is good to have in uh, your coffee grain at the end of the cup from this uh, base. But the difference were that when there was not enough potassium to go to the coffee grain, the plant would substitute it by calcium. Now calcium is a bigger, less dense particle than potassium, so your coffee grain would weigh a little bit less. But when we started to put in more potassium, 
we got to 89% of that 2.25 to be able to, be, in, to put, be put in as potassium. Potassium is smaller and more dense than calcium, so you would have better coffee grain density. So for fertilization, we first investigated the rain pattern, which was what making available the nutrients to our plants, measured the leaching, created the curve of absorption and time of critical need. We measured the solubility, related it to density and grain, and we created a program. But again, climate change. Now, it rained differently this year than last year. So we're still measuring every year. So this is what our research department is doing. We're measuring every year. Right now, we're measuring, we had the measurement for August. We're doing the one for September last, uh, last uh, Monday. And all of this measurement is done, done through a system they use in wineries here in Europe. So we got the system from a laboratory in Spain. We brought it to Guatemala. And the laboratory in Spain is doing this lab test because they're the only ones who have an ICO in this system a certification, which let us know that every time they're using the same system. What about the second part of what I told you? <laughs> Species that depend on whether may come out of sync? Well, this is happening, see? Coffee crop is at least 20% higher in areas where you have more bees. So people are taking care of the bees and they, we have our bee boxes in the farm and we bring them out to the fields so when it is time to pollinate, you have a, enough bees to be pollinating. But see, coffee is also affected by other insects which will eat out the roots, which will create uh, problems like nematodes, for example, will create an, uh, 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 two more in the roots and you're using insecticides to control these insects. So while you're trying to raise the bees, you're using insecticides that are killing your bees, right? So they'll go for sweet food faster than for anything else. So what we did is we created a system to control them through sweet tasting things like boric acid. So they'll come, they'll take the sugar back to their home. This boric acid will not allow their fungus that makes everything grow inside there. So their numbers will be regulated. They won't be exterminated as if you're applying insecticide, but you won't be affecting your bee pattern of growth. We're doing the same with millipod, with philophaga, with symphilida, with other insects that affect us. We're finding a way to control them without affecting the bees. What about the weeds? I told you they're becoming more prolific. Well, we started by trying to establish a parameter of what was the right control and we needed to see how much we were spending per day to control weeds. And we started to develop this new herbicide, which is provided by Bayer. And this herbicide will not affect as much the lower leaves. Herbicides that control other weeds will also affect coffee. For example, glyphosate, the way it works inside a plant is it will block the smelling amino acids but when pl coffee plants are flowering, boy, do they smell, don't they? Mm -hmm. So if you're using a herbicide that's blocking the amino acids of smell, then you're also blocking your flowers that are being... So we started by measuring root size, we started by seeing control, and we created the thing that is called flower counting and setting percentage through the year, and this is where we started how many flowers are formed, how many flowers bloom, how many flowers become coffee grain, and how many of those coffee grains do I collect at the end of the year. Now we've created this data for over 14 years, and in those 14 years, every year, little by little, all of this work has gone from a 60% of setting to a 91% of setting coffee flowers. So this has been a long way, but this means our program of fertilization has started to work. Our program of herbicides is working. Fungus. Everybody has heard about coffee roast, right? So coffee roast is a big issue. Coffee roast is due to climate change. We've worked first by establishing when is it happening, 
and which varieties it is affecting the most. And it seems like the varieties it affects the most are usually the ones that have the greatest taste. So we've created a whole system of controlling, seeing which fungicide works when and how is it going to work. You'll see it later on. We also we had a manual. We wrote a manual which is being distributed to other farmers just for this coffee roast. You'll see coffee roast will affect from 225 coffee grains per pound all the way to 347. So coffee roast will affect directly the size of the grain and of course this will affect your cup. So we've been working on this a lot. We are developing a product that is called Timorex, which we're working together with a company that has this product. This is a completely organic product. This is completely new. This is on the way of biologically controlling problems that are there. Uh, Timorex is a vegetable oil from a tree called Melaleuca. Now the greatest thing about this is that you've seen me talk about acetic acid so much today. See, acetic acid is produced to manage stress, but acetic comes from the word of abscission. So every time that the plant produces abscisic acid, it will drop leaves, it will drop coffee grains. See, that will be the side effect of abscisic acid. Now this new product that we found in the market that is a fungicide is completely organic, but guess what? It also regulates naturally the way the plant produces abscisic acid. So they have been something wonderful for us. This is Misena. I don't know if you're familiar with Misena, which is Soho de Gallo. Misena is one of the largest uh, funguses in, or the, big, the number one in dropping of leaves. So this is controls, this is leaf perch, this is coffee grain perch with Misena. We have better coffee grain size with, uh, without the abscisic acid. You've seen it in the fertilization. And so we come to the end and you would say, okay, so we've talked about the rain, we've talked about fertilization, we've talked about that. So what does this have to do with my coffee cup? Well, we found out that now, because of the research we're doing, we're more, we know more about our independence plant in the farm. We know how Bourbon is going to behave. We know how Katura is going to behave. We know how Katuai is going to behave. We know, I could say more personally, each of the different varieties we have, we know what their critical need for nitrogen. When is it going to create more abscisic acid? When is the coffee grain growing in each of the different varieties? Because believe it or not, coffee grain will grow faster in Aborbon than in Katuai. It will be almost 30 days of difference in growing of those varieties. So you need to be putting nitrogen faster in Bourbon than in Catray. So this has gotten us to be able to guarantee, to constantly guarantee to our buyers the same quality of coffee. I mean, the way we're fertilizing and we're doing everything, we're ensuring that our coffee plant can go the 100% of the flavor our coffee can have at the end of the year. I know this is a subject I would like to talk about all day long, but we have a time schedule to keep. I hope this illustrates more or less on what we are, where we're coming from, or what we are trying to do. We are trying to do all of our part in the farm so you guys can have a great cup of coffee that you can prepare here. So thank you very much, guys. so much. It is always so thrilling to listen to Francisco because you see how much time and how much passion he invests inside of his farm. Um, I know it's very scientific, but if you have any questions, we would be very, very happy to answer it now. Maybe also later here if you might think about some topics, rust or and topics are more interesting to you and you want to come and approach us afterwards, we will be here in time, so you can also ask afterwards questions. Is there anything right now coming up? I'm wondering, is it enough? Are you saying we have, we're measuring everything, we know much more, but is it enough given the, the growing stress that climate change is having on production? I'm pretty sure there's a lot more to be done. 
pretty sure. Um, this is what we've been able to do so far. I know there's, I know we should get, uh, I mean, bigger companies more involved in it. We're getting a lot of support by two big companies, which for us is great. For example, Bayer supporting the study from the herbicide um, and uh, Timlet supporting the part of the, actually the abscisic acid, they didn't even know that was happening, that we discovered on our own. Now they're doing over 5,000 samples with potato plantation and pepper because they don't have coffee here. They're doing that at the Weizmann Institute, I'm getting shared. They're going all the way to the molecular level, which is at a laboratory. They're pretty involved in this. I know that if we get to regulate the stress that plants are going through, I don't know if you're familiar with the Cook theory. The Cook theory says that any variety that exists up, exists up to today is able to by itself defend from all of what's bothering her around. But we create so much stress that uh, that is what succumbs the plants to the funguses and to the pests. So uh, if we were to regulate those stress factors, I'm pretty sure we would do much better without the use of more fungicides and more things like that. That's what we're trying to do. We're regulating the strains by use of silicium. I mean, there's much more we're doing, couldn't share it all today, but yeah, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of things missing. Broca, for example, I know Colombia, when they decided to take the insecticide of Broca out of the market, which was, it, it, it's a pretty bad uh, insecticide for everybody, they went from 15 million bags to 13 million bags because of Broca, and they are still having a pretty tough time controlling Broca. I know this product in Monex that we're using controls the population of Broca. I don't know why they are not investigating it. I don't know. We're only 15 hectares, so we're, you know, trying to keep up with everything. But yeah, you're right. A lot more should be done. I, well, I want to recognize the great work that you're doing. So I, it's really impressive what you've been sharing. Thank you. Speakers also to introduce themselves because we're such a small group, so I get to know each other. Maybe I'm sorry. I'm Niels. I'm with Conservation International. Okay, Niels. Yeah. Working on coffee. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Monica Omini, and Hi. I am pretty new to the coffee industry since so the first conference I'm attending. Um, and I have two projects ongoing. Uh, one is roasting coffee, and the other one is working directly with a coffee shop here in Germany. Um, so impressive as well, I agree with you, um, everything that you've done. I am wondering, everything, all your research is based on what's already happened. So how much of it can we foresee, can it help you to be proactive? I know climate change is nothing, I mean, not even close to your control, but are there any measures or anything that you have in mind so that all of this work has a more proactive help? to your own crop and everybody else that you're collaborating with? Well, yeah, we're, can I have a, yes, yeah. I wrote a book on the coffee roast to share of with my friends. <laughs> 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 well, the next book is coming <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> uh, this, this, this we're coming out until the, the last days of September. We, I wanted to share with my friends being so long in the coffee business and now that I understand how the triacyls work and how the strawberry rinds work, uh, um, I understand that any time you apply something to the, for every action there's a reaction and in coffee when you're over using fungicides the coffee grain will get slower, smaller and so there's times of application, there's how to manage it without getting to all the way to there. So all of what we're doing is for us to be able to make future plans.